143. 143. 1, 2, and 4. We need rescuing. I guess you realize that's the name of the song. Five seconds. Let us stand, please.
other than Jasmine. <laughs> Our IT department has a birthday today. Happy Valentine birthday. Happy birthday. Um, are there any announcements this morning? I'd like us to keep in prayer Janice's son, Kevin, who lives in Iowa, who is having more amputations. Um, oh my goodness. So anyway, she is not able to go out to visit him, but let's keep him in our prayers. Um, this is something I read this morning. Time. To slow for those who wait, time is. Time is too swift for those who fear. Time is too long for those who grieve. And time is too short for those who rejoice. But for those who love, time is eternity. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Bill, it's time for devotions. <laughs> as sure as the vine grows around the stump, you are my darling sweet sugar lump. <laughs> A poet uh, whose feet show it for Longfellow. <laughs> Among the thousands of sentiments printed on greeting cards, perhaps one of the most touching is the simple statement, thanks for being you. If you receive that card, you know that someone cares for you, not because you did something spectacular for that person, but because you're appreciated for your essence. I wonder if this kind of sentiment might indicate for us one of the best <coughs> ways to say thank you to God. Sure, there are times when God interviews in our lives in a tangible way, and we say something like, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to get that job. But most often, we can simply say, thank you, God, for being who you are. That's what's behind the verses like 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Thank you, God, for who you are, good and loving. And in Palm, Palms 7, 17, I will give thee thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. Thank you, God, for who you are, the Holy One. And let us come before him with thanksgiving, for the Lord is the great God. Psalm 95, 2, 3. Thank you, God, for who you are, the almighty God of the universe. <clears throat> who God is, that's the reason enough for us to stop what we're doing and praise and thank him. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, dear God, for being who you are, the almighty God who loves us and welcomes our love in return. Thank you for everything that makes you so magnificent. We stand in awe of you as we praise you with word and song. Amen. Amen. Elaine. Thank you. Thank 
good. Thank you. You good? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to be here and to see you. Could we open this lesson with just another little word of prayer? We thank you, Father, that we're able to be here on this beautiful, soft day. We thank you for every day you make for us. And we also want to thank you for making men and women. Amen. Well, for the past, today's the third week that we've had lessons that have focused on women. You know, um, the first lesson, prophesy, testify, and today we're gonna talk about women who support. You know, um, two weeks ago when we talked about prophesy, we um, talked about Anna, an aged widow. We talked about um, the group of women who followed Jesus and remained in Jerusalem after his ascension, you know, which included his mother Mary. And then also the band of, uh, or the group of unmarried women, the daughters of Philip the four uh, unmarried sisters. So the New Testament offers these as examples of first century women who were endowed with the gift of prophecy. And the, um, and they were they were important. The next week we talked about being called to testify. And the story of um, Jesus's encounter with the woman at the well served several purposes, but the real meaning from that is this woman who. Um, came to get water at a time of day when she knew others wouldn't be there, only to encounter Jesus and be transformed. The village's object of derision became the mouthpiece of the Lord to bring others to faith. So she gave the testimony that changed a whole village who actually scorned her into believers. So we all have that power to transform ourselves and others. So today we're going to talk about women who are called to support. <coughs> and our, um, we'll start with Luke 8, 1 through 3. After this, Jesus traveled from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. In Mark chapter 15, some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, we're at the crucifixion. Mother of Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome. And then we go back, we go forward to John chapter 20. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them the things he had said to her. Now, there's no doubt at this point in time, Jesus was a celebrity. Although the term doesn't do justice to him, he was celebrated for the value of his teachings and for the miracles he performed. His teachings and his miracles both brought joy to those who followed him. And as we consider some of the women who experienced that joy, theirs can be ours as well. Now, Jesus became well known in the Jewish villages and towns of Galilee by traveling among the people. Peter described this by saying Jesus went around doing good. A ministry that included teaching, healing, and casting out demons. Jesus traveled with a large group that included the core 12 disciples and others. The opportunity for women to play a prominent role in Jesus' ministry made it unusual. Jerusalem had no famous women rabbis. The Jewish High Council, the Sanhedrin, had no female members. The prominent sects, the Sadducees and Pharisees, were made up of men only. The inclusion of women who were not the wives or other family of the disciples was even more unusual. Many charges were made against Jesus during his ministry, including drunkenness, Sabbath breaking, blasphemy, and using the power of Satan. Because women traveled with them regularly, we might expect similar charges regarding sexual sins, but no record claims that either Jesus or any of his disciples, male or female, were accused of sexual immorality while they ministered together. Mary Magdalene was one of those women. She has been especially misunderstood throughout our history. Some factions have tried to uncover a romantic entanglement between Mary Magdalene and Jesus. These stories are found only in sources written long after the first century. Um, other legends claim that Mary traveled from Jerusalem <coughs> after the crucifixion to the south of France. Medieval accounts sometimes included Mary in the legends concerning the Holy Grail, the cup Jesus supposedly used at the Last Supper. Yet the actual biblical accounts about Mary Magdalene are sparse on details and have none of these legendary elements. Her real witness is even greater than those. Now, um, Luke 4 introduced Jesus' first preaching tour, Galilee. And now let's go to Luke 8, which takes us to the beginning of Jesus' second preaching there. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Luke summarizes Jesus' strategy for the near future. He continued to tour Galilee. Towns were larger population centers that had markets and government officials, but villages were small clusters of homes where people who worked the farms lived, perhaps alongside a few merchants and craftsmen. Both villages and towns would have one or more synagogues, which were community centers for Jewish worship. The twelve were with him. The twelve refers to those disciples whom Jesus also called apostles. And also some women had been, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Certain women also followed Jesus from village to village. Perhaps because the twelve of the previous verse were all men, sometimes we forget that women traveled with Jesus. They played important roles in his ministry, though often in the background. Yeah. The Greek word, translated cured, 
suggest a total restoration, not just absence of disease. Physical health is restored when diseases are overcome. Spiritual health is restored when evil spirits are driven out. To be Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. The name Mary is a form of the name of Moses' sister Miriam. She was a prophetess and musician leader of women during the exodus from Egypt. Mary's nickname Magdalene comes from her home, the village of Magdala, located near Tiberias on the western coast of the Sea of Galilee. This would be like calling someone from the city of Dallas, Tex, a nod to his home state. Mary Magdalene is mentioned at least twice in each gospel, making her one of the most frequently mentioned women in the New Testament. And then we go to Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Now, Joanna likely had resources to contribute to the cost of sustaining the traveling group. Her husband, Chusa, served the Galilean governor, Herod Antipas. Chusa's position as manager was a trusted one and likely came with an excellent salary. Then Susanna, otherwise unknown in the New Testament, she shares a name with the Jewish heroine whose story occurs in the uh, apocryphal uh, addition to the book of Daniel. And then 3C and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So it says at least some of the many others were undoubtedly motivated to be near Jesus because of being healed by him. They followed out of selfless gratitude provided money, time, and other support for his ministry. Such women were the unsung heroes of the group, just as many noble women in churches today. And now uh, we go to 40A. Some women were marching, <coughs> marching from a distance. We're at the crucifixion, where several women refused to abandon Jesus. While some women watched from a distance, Others stood much closer, close enough to hear Jesus speak from the cross. One or more women may be in both groups, moving back and forth as Jesus suffered. Listing in John 19.25 differs from what follows here, suggesting that none of the gospel writers <clears throat> intended to give an exhaustive listing of the women present. Verse 40b, among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. Mary Magdalene is perhaps the leader of this group. The second Mary is further identified by the naming of her sons. James the Younger is likely the son of Alphaeus mentioned in the list of apostles. The phrase uh, the Younger may distinguish him from the more prominent apostle James the son of Zebedee. This Mary may also have been the mother of Levi or Matthew. And the third woman, Salome, is probably the mother of Zebedee's sons. The time for following Jesus was not over for these loyal women. They remained with him in those dreadful hours, watching and waiting for an opportunity to minister to the Savior once more. <clears throat> that opportunity came a few hours later when they observed where Jesus' body was laid and resolved to remedy his hasty burial with customary spices. So now we meet Mary Magdalene for the third time, this occasion being resurrection morning. Arriving at the tomb, she found it open. She ran to tell Peter and John who ran to the tomb to see for themselves. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. Again, the reaction of the disciples can be compared and contrasted with that of Mary. Whereas the men went to where they were staying to think about what the empty tomb could mean, Mary stayed. The tomb was a cave-like room carved into the limestone hillside, 
And although Mary already knew it was empty, she probably hoped to notice something that she missed earlier, some hint of what happened. Mary's heart was broken at this apparent insult to her Lord. But when she bent over, verse 12 says, and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Jesus' body had been laid on a carved ledge inside the tomb, but instead of holding the body, it had become the witness to the presence of two angels. Though their white clothes could have clued Mary regarding their identity, the angels could have also looked ordinary. Their sitting at the head and foot emphasized the absence of the expected occupant. Verse 13, they ask her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. Despite the unexpected presence, Mary did not seem to recognize the two angels as supernatural. Their question, not a rebuke, but an act of kindness, inquiring as to the nature of her pain. Though addressing her as woman may seem abrupt to modern ears, the term here should be taken as a respectful address. Regardless of who these two were or why they were there, Mary blurted out the cause of the great burden on her heart. The mystery of Jesus' absence could be solved if someone would just tell her where they put him, presumably in another tomb for reasons unknown. She did not consider that Jesus may not be dead. Then in verse 14, at this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize yeah. it was Jesus. Apparently, not expecting an answer from the white-clad visitors, Mary turned from the tomb and saw another person in the garden. We are told this is Jesus before Mary knew, much like we knew the other two were actually angels. How could she have failed to recognize this person she loved so much? Perhaps her tears obscured her vision, but of course we know this is not the only time after the resurrection that disciples failed to recognize Jesus. His post-resurrection body was different in some way. But that body also bore the marks of the crucifixion. And the changes in his appearance, plus the utter impossibility of his being alive, probably contributed mightily to her lack of recognition. Verse 15, he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she says, Sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you put him and I will get him. Jesus repeated the angel's question, thus pushing the heart of, to the heart of Mary's suffering. He already knew she was weeping because of his death and was seeking his body. But Mary, still not recognizing Jesus, repeated her response. The tomb where, Mary's, uh, where Jesus' body had been placed was that of Joseph of Arimathea and it was apparently located within a well-maintained garden. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni. Jesus did not explain. In one of the most dramatic moments found in the gospel accounts, he simply spoke her name. Mm -hmm. And she knew his voice. Amen. She had heard Jesus say her name many times before. All her plans unraveled, for there was no corpse to minister to. Amen. Mary addressed Jesus with the title of respect she had used many times. Rabboni is a variation on the title, title Rabbi, which means my teacher. The form used by Mary may imply heightened respect, something like my honored teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus' command, do not hold on to me, has a dimension beyond merely rejecting a hug. Apparently, Mary's desire was to somehow detain Jesus to cause him to stay with her 
and the other disciples. However, Jesus would ascend to his father. There would be no negotiating his departure. Instead of clinging to him, Mary was to go back to the men who had been there earlier and update them on what had actually happened and had been said at the tomb. So verse 18, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. Amen. And she told them that he had said these things to her. She didn't prepare an elaborate presentation. Her testimony was basic and beautiful. Sometimes the most effective witnessing is in telling of our experience with Jesus and the changes he brings to our lives. Mary had plenty to say that day, explaining how a heartbroken, sobbing woman became a joyous, confident eyewitness for the disciples. Jesus knew her name, and he called her to serve him by being his witness. In conclusion today, you know, we often portray non-believers who come to church as seekers. We say that those who seek Jesus will find him. In today's story, Mary Magdalene, a firm disciple and believer, was a seeker in a different sense. She sought Jesus' body and was not easily dissuaded from her quest. But that quest was mistaken for there was no longer a dead body. Try as she might, Jesus did not, Mary did not find Jesus. He found her. Jesus had first found Mary to deliver her from demonization. He then found her weeping in a tomb, a woman for whom the recent days had been a dark nightmare. Isaiah promised, God will come to save you. As it was with Mary, so it is with us. If we seek Jesus but don't find him, it may be because our search is based on a mistaken idea. This was so meaningful to me. You know, during these past few months, it, you, I think probably we've all prayed so hard for what do, you, what do we do and uh, are, are you with us? At, but we clear up any mistakes by reading the facts of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension in the Bible. That's where hearing his call starts. So let's close with a prayer. Father, we thank you for the hope we have through your son Jesus, a hope that overcomes our fears. May we, like Mary and the other women who followed Jesus throughout his ministry, crucifixion, and resurrection, never lose our desire to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And our thought to remember today is, Jesus knows where and how to find those who seek him. Amen. That's a reassuring word. Yes. Thank you. Beautiful. Sorry, it takes me a long time. Thank you, Elaine, for your I'm usual wonderful lesson. Thank you. These are some puns I found that you might find I love puns. amusing. <laughs> and some of them, recognition may come a little bit late, so I mean, that's all right. Acupuncture is a jab well done. <laughs> Dijon View, the same mustard as before. <laughs> Practice safe eatings. Always use condiments. <laughs> Shotgun wedding, a case of wife or death. <laughs> a man needs a mistress just to break the monogamy. <laughs> a hangover is the wrath of grapes. <laughs> <laughs> Dancing cheek to cheek is really a form of floor play. <laughs> That's F L O O R. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Reading while sunbathing makes you well read. <laughs> uh, 
When two egotists meet, it's an eye for an eye. <laughs> and a bicycle can't stand on its own because it is too tired. <laughs> what is the definition of a will? A dead giveaway. <laughs> and last, time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> we'll all stand in these. <laughs> Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And happy birthday, our IT girl, Jasmine. Okay. Next.